Happy Monday, everybody. It's time for another edition of Ask Mike. Courtney Mims alongside Mike Irwin here. Mike, it may not be a happy Monday for you because your weekend was almost perfect. It did really start out well, as you know, because we have uh, college football on our station. What usually happens after we do, do our game show is you got all day long to watch football if, if Arkansas is playing a night game. Yeah. So I watched a lot of games, and it was so good because the Aggies got beat, right? Yep. Aggies North got beat, Missouri. They got beat. Aggies Dinky North. Wits got beat. Okay. Okay. Then Texas got beat. That yeah. was the, probably the best one of them all. Then Gus got beat, so Gus and Dinky Wits got beat. So all that's going good. And then, I mean, they could have won. I know. They could have beat Ole Miss. They just... Weird thing. I mean, so all of a close. sudden you don't have a running game against a team that's not that good against the run? What, what's going on there? There's a lot of questions. If you had told me that they could hold Ole Miss's offense to 27 points, I thought Arkansas would score in the 30s. Yeah. I just thought Ole Miss would score in the 50s. Yeah, me too. And it was just not that way. Yeah, I mean, that, there's something to be said about Arkansas's defense this year under Travis Williams. Much better. Um, we'll talk about um, that. We're going to talk about that because you guys have a ton of questions, like Mike was teasing, about this Ole Miss game. So we are going to jump right into it. Our first question is from H.L. McCamish, who wants to know, what is your assessment of why K.J. Jefferson is struggling too much to run this offense? I keep hearing that it doesn't fit him, but why not? Well, I still think it's not a good fit for him. I think the one he was in was, was the fit, and I think Kendall Bryles knew that and, and worked his offense around and did a better job. Now, he had, he had time to work with him, uh, but I think it still doesn't fit him that well. But I've shifted my thinking on that a little bit because of something Sam Pittman said after the game, which was, you don't have a running game. And I think all of these problems that we're seeing K.J. have might go away to a great extent if you had a running game and an offensive line that could pass block. I'm still, I still think he would be better off running the old offense, the, the tempo RPO offense, as opposed to, you know, being a quarterback that's stuck as a drop back, well, not a drop back passer, but a pocket passer, and he is required to make reads and do a lot of things that he doesn't, that's not his thing. But, again, I think if you had better run blocking, which meant a better running game, and if you had pass blocking, I think K.J. would be performing a lot better. I think this offense, the, the, it's not the offense that's causing him to throw picks. It's the fact that wide receivers aren't getting open. Yeah. And they, he, because of the lack of time to throw the ball, he's having – I talked for two or three weeks about – Throw the ball in the area by the line over the linebackers and, and 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 behind the cornerbacks, but those areas are still crowded with people. I think teams opposing defenses know that, and yeah. so they're dropping people back very quickly. When it, you when you don't have a running game, then people assume okay they got a pass here, so yeah. they're more ready for that. So that last pass, for instance, that last interception that KJ threw. He's trying to get it away in a hurry, but he throws it. I think it was Tesla, but it might not have been. But he throws it to, to somebody that's double covered about eight yards down the field, and it's a pick. And so, again, I don't think it's the offense that's causing him to do that. I think it's the lack of, of uh, run blocking and pass blocking. Absolutely. And Sam Pittman kind of alluded to that today in his press conference because we, I was talking to Jacob, who goes to the press conferences on Monday, and one of the things he is going to talk about in the show for us tonight is the fact that K Sam Pittman said KJ is trying to to put every to be the hero to put everybody on his back and and it's just too much right now when you don't have an offensive line that can help him out when you don't have the running game help him out. That's right. so why KJ was so frustrated after the matchup. He talked about the frustrations of not getting the running game going. You have to have that if you're wanting to help out your quarterback. You can't ask him to be Superman right now. You just can't. Yeah. Just can't. Going to the next question, Hog Redneck says, Pittman hired a new defensive coordinator, and it seems like those guys are adapting to the new defense and getting better every week. So why is the offense going backwards under a new offensive coordinator? To me, it's clear that Sam made a mistake when he hired Dan Eno. So what's he going to do about it? You know, you'd have to be – you'd have to be <laughs> – Sam Pittman, maybe even Hunter Juracek. We don't know if he's going to be required to make a change, so we don't know. Um, again, 
There's so many things you, you could get into when you talk about what Enos is doing. But again, if you accept the notion of what we just talked about, which is it doesn't matter what offense you run, if you, don't, if you can't block, either run or pass block, it's going to cause problems for your offense. So it may not be totally on him. Mm. I do think, again, most, I think most defensive coordinators, when they come into a system, especially when you've got a quarterback that's in his last year as a starter, and he's played three seasons, not full seasons, two full seasons and then his freshman year, you mean an offensive coordinator, right? When you have an offensive yeah, coordinator that I comes say? in. Defense. Defensive, it's uh, okay. When you have an offensive coordinator that comes into that system, you should take into consideration what you're dealing with. That's the one question I think everybody's asking about Enos is when he came in and you, the first thing you do is start studying video and you might look at KJ and say, mm, I don't know there. But again, I don't think he, for whatever reason, I don't think he anticipated the blocking problems. Mm. And that's probably why you didn't see that. I feel like, and, and maybe you can back me up on this, that KJ is trying to adapt to Enos's offense, whereas maybe Enos should have come in or after the first couple of games where maybe yes, it wasn't working. Maybe. But what I'm saying now, and I've changed my position on that, what I'm saying now is even running last year's offense, mm -hmm. I think this would have been a problem. It's still a problem just because of that offensive line and yeah. the blocking. Okay. All right. Eddie Lynn says you indicated on Twitter last week that a name booster told you that Sam Pittman will not be fired after this season. Did he give a reason? Is this guy one of Pittman's buddies? No. In fact, <laughs> in, in the course of that no. conversation, he was critical of Sam Pittman in some areas. He said he, he, he specifically faulted him for not being able to look down the road when he made this offensive coordinators hire and see some of the issues and see that you shouldn't hire somebody that's going to come in and change the offense quite a bit. So he said that, that is a lack of understanding of, he said a head coach should have a better knowledge of offensive uh, issues there. So he was critical. But why does he think he's not going to get fired? And this is interesting because he said, you have to understand how athletic directors think. They're not fans. You can go completely backwards and usually do when you make a change like this. Everybody wants something new every two years or three years. If it's not working, get rid of the guy, hire somebody else, which causes problems with buyout, which saddles you with extra money problems, and then you got to have the money to hire another coach. He said in Pittman's case, the way they're looking at this is he's really had a, never had a losing season. And I'm going, well, wait a minute. That first year was a losing yeah. season. You know, they, they won three games and lost, uh, there was a 10 game, so it was three and seven, yeah. right? And he said, yeah, but if, it was the COVID year. And he said, you played 10 SEC games and they won three. Now, if you played eight SEC games and you won three and you won your four non-conference games, you'd, you'd win seven games in the regular season, so you'd be seven and five. And he said, that's the way they look at that. Okay. That was a, that was a no, it's, it's, it's a logical yeah, argument. Yeah. It was a COVID year, everything was weird. I, I guess, And, and yeah. plus, Arkansas' schedule was the toughest at that year. Everyone conceded they had a tougher skate. They played both Alabama and Georgia. They did, yeah, that was a really and tough And played schedule. Tennessee and beat them. So, you know, there's an, uh, an acknowledgement that that first year, and, and then you're coming off of two back-to-back -back years where you didn't win a conference game. So winning three games was considered good. Okay, so then the next year you win nine games. The next year after that you only win, what, seven, but the, there was a general belief that K.J. was hurt in three of those games. If, he play, if he's available and healthy in, in those three games when he was hurt, maybe you win ten games. So they don't sense that they were going backwards. So this is the first year when there's been a kind of a, wait a minute, you may be going backwards. And what he said is, if you're trying to improve a program, yes, it would be nice if it constantly got better every year. But he said, people with, with any knowledge of football and understanding how you're trying to build a program know that you can go down and then back up. He said, what happens is the fans don't have the patience for that. But he said, an athletic director who has to deal with money issues, who has to deal with all the issues that are going to come if you get rid of a coach, got to pay a buyout, got to pay a big bucks to get a new guy, then that guy's got, got to come in. Now, I will say this. It is easier to me to build a program with the, in, the, in these portal days than it used to be. 
So that's an argument for, hey, you should make a change mm -hmm. quicker than normal. But he's just saying he doesn't think that in most cases, given what Sam Pittman has done, his body of work up until now, there's no, even this year he said he's not, they're not terrible. They've, they've got a losing record, but come on, there are teams that are a lot worse than they are. So he's just saying it's not panic time. That's, that's a okay. booster that okay. knows what's going I'd on. I'd like to revisit, and this is my, my, my initial thought process, because I get that they're giving him a pass for the COVID year. Okay, my argument to that would be, what if you played a non-conference opponent that was really good and you lost those games? I'm just, you know, I'm just thinking. Then you, don't, you just don't know what would have happened. You don't know. You can't chalk those up to extra wins if you play someone like Liberty, remember last year? And yeah, I know. You know, things like that. So, but my question is, do you reevaluate that do you reevaluate that if they go and lose to Alabama well if they go and lose to Mississippi State sure do you reevaluate that yeah. because then you're in a bye week and you're in a totally different situation than you were here at this point in the sure. season that maybe that makes a difference but we're, 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 we're I'm only talking to him I know. In, the, <laughs> in the present tense I know I'm just he's talking about what's going on right now and that was a week ago that's so. that's true I just would I'd like to have you call him up again I just and don't see. have a sense and and the reason I, I talk to this particular booster is he knows other boosters with a lot of money and he just basically told me he does not have the get the sense right now that a bunch of these guys think Sam Pittman is a terrible hire and needs to go they haven't reached that point yet. Yeah. They're not convinced he can't fix this thing. Well, and, and a lot of people agreed with our point last week of if you fire Sam Pittman, you lose a, you, you possibly lose a guy like Travis Williams. You'll lose that defensive staff that, we, that people have no problems with right now. You might even lose Morgan Turner, like I made a point. Those are things yeah. that and you got to think about. But then you've got people saying things like hire, fire him and hire Jimmy Smith because Jimmy Smith was a successful okay. high school coach. Yeah, I have heard that. Yeah. But come on. I mean, that's, that's <laughs> now you're back doing what Pittman, what you did with Pittman. Yeah. You know, you're hiring a guy without head co coaching experience in college. So. And I think the other question is, is maybe before you even make a move like that of firing somebody, you have to say, who are you going to hire? Who is out there? Who is available? <clears throat> and that's a question for Hunter Yurichek to ask himself. Is. That is not he's, a question for he's us. He's in to... that position. We're not. Exactly. Gideon Henry says, never really got the Bryles haters, but he built an offense around the players he had. He did. He knows once the players, he has to fit his offense. I was just making this point uh, uh, two questions ago. No way KJ and Rocket have regressed like this. Here's what I'm going to say, and it, again, it, it, re, it reflects an adjustment in my thinking because I don't think the same thing all the time. As games go by and I see <laughs> other things, I change my opinion on this. I now think that even if Bryles were still here, no change had been made there. With this offensive line, they would be still in a mess. Maybe they would have won one of these games. Maybe they don't lose to BYU. I don't know. That would make a big difference, I guess, if you didn't lose that game. But I just think I'm, I'm not willing to blame all of this on Bryles right now. You mean on Enos? I mean Enos right now. I'm not willing to because I just – some of the issues I'm seeing right now, I don't know what you could do. Uh, with a different offense to make those things not happen. Well, I think it's some of the decision-making, right? There were some games in which there was play calling, and but, I'm st but as this thing goes on, Sam Pittman said it, and it was just like a bell went off in my head when he said after the game, you, this offense is not built for what we're doing because we can't run the ball. Hmm. Well, you think he went, Oh, I think we can run the ball, therefore this offense is okay. It'll work, and then I'll do, you know. I mean, yeah. it's, it's just, it happens that way sometimes. That's all I'm saying. And I, I'm not trying to defend, defend Enos and say he's doing a great job, and he, I'm not saying he should stay. I don't make those decisions. I'm saying I adjusted my thinking on that a little bit over the last week or so, and I now believe that what's happening with K.J., would have happened to him even in the other offense if, if, with this offensive line. I don't disagree with you there, but I think the the point of making, I think it would have been maybe a little bit different when it came to decision making. That's for sure. We'll get into I that a little play, later because I, I got some thoughts on his decision making. Okay. All right. Okay. I, 
I respect you on that. I'll, I'll wait to hear what you have to say in that question, Mike. Lewis Freeland says, I know everybody is all ticked off. Yeah, we are, Lewis Freeland. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm a Kool-Aid drinker, but I was excited to see what Ty Washington did against the Black Bears. Look at that. And am I the only one who noticed that the offensive line blocked better after Pittman put them back in their original positions? No, you weren't because we both know that. Yeah, noticed we noticed that. that which made us think, why did he do that in the first place? <laughs> we were like, the experiment did not work. Yeah, so it was better after they went back to the, to the other thing. Look, this question, I wasn't sure I was, because this question came in a day or so ago, but I was, I was watching the Cowboys last night. Oh, okay. And I have this buddy that I grew up with. He's living next door to me. His dad went to Baylor, and he's a Baylor fan. Yep. But he's yeah. also a huge Cowboys fan. And he was mad because of the way they were playing. I was like, come on, man, this was predictable. I saw this coming. Mm -hmm. He was talking about how bad it is. It means Dallas is not really any much better than we thought. Even the defense is not that good. Blah, 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 blah. And he's saying all that stuff. So eventually, the conversation turned to Arkansas. And he knows about Arkansas. He watches all the games because he, he's retired and he's, he's got all that stuff where you can watch every game if you want to. So he's familiar with what's happened. And he said, what's going on with Arkansas it isn't even remotely comparable to what I see with some other teams. And he said, look, every one of those games was winnable if you had a break here, this thing happened, mm -hmm. guy fumbles and you, you, they, you get on it instead of they got on it. He said, there wasn't one game in that stretch. And he said, they're all games away from home. And not one of them is a game that with a break or two here, they could have won that game. Maybe you don't win them all like that, but you could have won some of these games. And they were all close. The AM game was 12 points. That's the biggest one. If you average it up, it's an average loss of seven points a game during that stretch. And he said, these are, your, these are, four, these are three of your four best teams in, in your division. So it's not like you're getting beat by Vanderbilt, you know? <laughs> He said, so what, hog fans are going ape over this? And I tried to explain to him. I said, look, Sam Pittman is carrying the burden of the John L. Smith year, the Bielema come, go up, come back down, and crash and burn year, terrible Chad Morris years. Mm -hmm. He's like trying to swim to the shore, and he's got all of them hanging on his back. He and does, I'm going, yeah. oh, and he's getting tired yeah. you know, as he's trying to get to the shore. And I said, that's why Razorback fans are mad. It's all of that on top of this in which they see them going back downhill this year. And it's, again, it's what we talked about earlier. Fans don't, fans want steady progress. Mm -hmm. And so if there's a dip, they assume the dip because they look down the road negative. The dip means you're going to just, if, you, if this coach stays here, he's going to get worse and worse yeah. and worse. And your AD may not assume that. He may assume it's a temporary, okay, temporarily ended up with this offensive line problem, maybe hired the wrong guy as offensive coordinator, but he'll get this thing fixed. He's good at the portal. He's yep. recruiting okay. We don't want to fire him and then end up with a recruiting disaster as everybody yeah. that we've got committed. They've got some five stars committed down they, the road at 2026. Do. You don't want to lose guys like that. So, and, and he's a good guy. Everybody likes him. He's a good representative. We like him as a front man for our school, you know, when he's on TV and talks and all this stuff. So, you know, it, it, there's all of that going on. But it, that's not to say fans are wrong for being upset no. because fans have a right to feel however they want. And I, and I feel like you mentioned it. It was because of all the bad before they have just felt like they've been in this lull for a longer time than most. And I think if I can... If you took away all that other stuff, Pittman would... There wouldn't be a, a people saying you're firing. Exactly. But they're, they're, that past is still in their minds. If that, he took those, over right after Petrino got fired. Oh, yeah. It would be, yeah, it'd be fine. I, I agree with you there. Um, I do want to mention something because you brought up something really good there, the recruits. Go and look. Otis Kirk and I sat down with um, the Greenwood brothers right. and Cash and Kane Archer. And Kane, 2026 guy, quarterback, Regarded as one of the best in that class, y'all. The best in, in the that country. class. In the country. In that class. And he sat there and said, because I asked each of them, what do you like about the coaching staff? And Cash is uh, the defensive side of the ball. He plays, you know, an edge, outside linebacker, kind of switches back and forth. And um, I asked both of them about the coaches. Obviously, Cash had great things to say about Travis Williams and those guys. Lots of energy. Likes that vibe. 
You know what Cain talked about? He talked about Sam Pittman. How would you not want to play for a guy like Sam Pittman? I love Sam Pittman. He is awesome. People don't understand how great of a coach he is. He knows what he is doing. He is awesome. I love the man. I would run through a brick wall for him. That is the and attitude. And this is him you're... after they lost the game the I... other night. Yes, this was him on Sunday. And so listen, go and listen to so him. So fire him and you may lose this kid. Well, yeah. I mean, you may you, you may flip him somewhere else, but I, I mean, I don't know if he's actually verbally committed or anything. Yeah, but, but it sounds he's like, interested. He's interested. Sounds like they, they got a good shot at him. <laughs> exactly. And it's because, what did he talk about? He talked a little bit about Enos, but he talked about Sam So he's, it's safe to say that he's not on the internet talking about how cra cra crappy uh, Pittman is as a head coach. No, no. I mean, he's over there singing his praises. I, I, you know, I love Sam Pittman. He's awesome. I love his attitude. He knows what he is doing. So, hey, that's a 2026 guy who, uh, one of the best in the nation in his class. So there you go. That's a... Uh, just wanted to bring that up. Said76 wants to know, why do you think our offense looks so slow? Every play is slow developing and looks like our guys are stuck in mud. Absolutely no explosiveness at all. Don't recall it looking like that during the first stint of Enos. I think that when you don't have success, I don't care who, who you're talking about, <clears throat> if you're talking about offensive linemen, running backs, the quarterback himself, a lack of success brings about confusion because you're out there on the field wanting something to work mm -hmm. and then it doesn't and it starts piling up in your head. And I think it's especially true of KJ. When you have, 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 when you have had success and then you don't have it, you become indecisive. And being indecisive slows you down. There was a, uh, there was a play toward the end of the game, Arkansas had driven down, I think it's when they kicked their last field goal. And they were down around the four or five yard line, if you remember. And KJ's back, and he he get he get, takes the snap, and you can see it when you look at it on replay. The entire right side of Ole Miss's offense is just open, and so if he goes to his left, he's got a clear path to the goal line. Instead, he ignored that and went straight into the area of the defensive tackle, trying to push his way over, <laughs> and it went right into the strength of their defense. I think some of that, again, is your head spinning. You're, not, you're trying to make something happen, but you're not cool, calm, and collected. You're not looking. You're not looking around and reading. You're just going, poof, I've got to do this. I, again, offensive line. <clears throat> DJ Williams did a tremendous job on the breakdown for our game day show. He did. Where he took what went on in the A&M game, and he showed what happens on a lot of these plays. And what happened? You had guys blocking the wrong person. Now, what did Sam Pittman talk about in his Monday press conference this week? He talked about Ole Miss doing a lot of stunning. Teams have been doing that this year, some more than others. If you've never been an offensive line, let me try, lineman, let me try to explain this to you. You come up, you get out on the line of scrimming, there's a guy over you, it's real easy to say, yeah, I'm supposed to block that guy. But what if he moves hard to his right or hard to his left? You don't necessarily follow him. You've got blocking rules. And I can remember in high school, the offensive line coach sitting down and drawing all this up because he looked at the opposing team and he had arrows for everything. And if this guy does this, you do that. People who say that linemen are dumb, you're stupid yourself for saying that because a good offensive lineman has to learn so many things like that. And they have to get it down instinctually, so that, so instinctively, so that you know automatically if he does this, you do that. Now, the way that works, it's a matter of first of all, you study it, and you go home that night because you do this on Sunday. At least where I played, you did. <laughs> you did that on Sunday. You went home that night and you studied the little drawings that you had, and you got it in your head. Then you came out on Monday, and they tested you on that. They put a scout team guy over you. He moves. He moves. They got a, a guy back there telling him before every snap, this is what you're doing. And so he moves here. He moves there. He backs up. You got to know what to do in, all of the, in every one of those situations, and they do it over and over. One of the things that made Ken Hatfield successful, I used to watch their workouts. You could do that in those days, watch the whole oh, workout. That sounds so nice. And I would go out there and watch their entire workout. They would have a little bit of period of time at the start where they warmed up and then they ran a few drills. 
but mostly they just ran plays over and over and over and over. And anytime there was a screw up, there was there was an instant stop and make a correction. Now you're gonna if you screwed up on a play somebody did, they'd run it, he'd run it three more times in a row to make sure that lineman or that running back or whoever messed up had it down. Well, this is what you do in practice with stunting defenses. You're running this over and over and over for an over an hour sometimes, just making sure that you're reacting properly to this movement. So this is, these are some of the things that go on. Now, we're not out there. No. I can't tell you they're not doing that. Maybe they are. Maybe you've got with this group linemen that just can't figure it out. I don't know. But they are blocking the wrong people. Anytime you're double teaming somebody that you're not supposed to, guess what? The guy you were supposed to block goes back and makes the tackle. So it's just, it's easy for us to sit here and talk about this, but there are things we don't know because we're not out there on that practice field. We're not in those meetings. We're not sure how the, all of these things are being addressed. Yeah, absolutely. And, and couple that with the fact that you come out in this game and you've switched some things up. On, you came out last week and you switched it up on the offensive line. So you have guys in different positions. Maybe they're a little uncomfortable. They're taken out of that comfort zone maybe. And you've added a whole nother element, right, maybe for this past week into that with it last week. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, um, moving on to the next question. I was trying to find my spot there, Mike. Mousetown says, Pittman's big flaw is that he hires too many of his buddies. Oh, interesting. Well, that's a common complaint. Interesting. Barry Odom, Scott Fountain, Cody Kennedy, and Danny Nose. None of them have been very good, and he hasn't fired any of them. It's not good business to hire your pals. Well, I would agree that it's you got to be very careful when you hire somebody that's a friend, but I would dispute some of those. Uh, I understand why he hired uh, I, why he hired Barry Odom, because Pittman had never been a head coach. Odom had been a fairly successful co head coach at one time. They're friends. He hired him to be the assistant head coach to at least the first year or two to be there when when he needed to have questions. And, hey, did I do the right thing here? What would you have done there? So there was a reason for that hire. But also look what happened. When it reached the point in which Odom needed to go, he went on his own. If you've got that kind of an arrangement, that's not a bad hire, in my opinion. I don't think it was a bad hire. Scott Fountain had a, a bad first year. Two or three times in the second year there were some issues, but it's basically worked ever since that first year. I mean, show me where Arkansas special teams are horrible. Well, Cam, Cam Little, I can show you where they're good. <laughs> yeah. So, again, I, I don't know that I would question the, the fountain thing. Kennedy, nobody was complaining about him last year, were they? Was there complaints about I, Cody Kennedy? I don't think there was last year. It's really come up this year That's that what I've I'm seen saying. the, you know. So all of a sudden it pops, it becomes a bad hire in year four. So you should have known in year one that that was a bad hire. Mm -hmm. Um I don't know that, you know, that, that that holds water. The Enos thing is the only one you look at, and that's all we've got to go on is this year. What if he comes back next year and the offense is a lot better? You, what you say at any given time talking about the sport of football or really any other sport could be wrong later yeah. on. You know, you run the risk of that. But as far as the issue of hiring your friends, here's what I would say. If you're going to hire a friend, have a – frank conversation with that person before they take the job and say, you got to understand something. We're friends, but there may come a time when I have to fire you. Is this going to ruin our <laughs> friendship? You, you better be ready for that because it, just hiring you. Now, what if, this is the real problem with hiring friends. What if you don't have that conversation and you hire them and at some point you need to fire them, but you don't, and then you get yourself fired. That's when hiring friends is, is bad. Yeah. And we haven't played it out long enough to see if that happens. <laughs> and we haven't. I mean, it's just interesting, though, hiring friends. And, and I, like you said, I, I agree with you on Barry Odom and Scott Fountain and, um, and what you said about Cody Kennedy and Danny Nose, too. But, like, Kendall Bryles wasn't in there. He wasn't a friend of Sam's, right? No, no. So, and I mean, that not every hire, Travis Williams, not a friend of Sam's. Like, I mean, not every hire. No, he's not. But he's, hire, he's saying he's hiring too many. He's too he, many of them. And he has hired some. But the point is, we haven't seen how that plays out at the end. To me, it's only a bad idea if they are unsuccessful and you don't fire them 
because they're your friend and then you get fired. Then then that was a, an example of why you shouldn't hire your friends. Yeah. It's up, it depends on you, the head coach. If you can hire somebody that's your friend because you genuinely think they're good too, with the understanding that, hey, I may have to fire you someday and they're like okay with it and then you fire them because you, you determine, hey, it's not working out here. You can go to them and say, oh, I'm not saying you're not good at what you do. It's not working out here. Yeah. And if you can do that, then it's not a bad idea. But again, if you get yourself fired, then it's a terrible idea. <laughs> you would think these guys would know that, though, because it's college football, and that's that's the business, right? It's kind of one of those things. I mean, if you go, I mean, that's any business, right? If you get hired by a friend of yours, and then you don't pan out to be doing your job, they're going to have to fire you. Right. So, I mean, that's just, I, that seems a little bit, uh, I guess, goes without saying kind of thing. Blood Red Hog asks, does it seem to you the season is spiraling out of control? This gets back to what I talked about earlier with this friend of mine that's a Baylor fan. Spiraling out of control would be a very common way to put this if you're a Razorback fan. How is three games against three ranked teams, because they, weren't they all ranked? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ranked pretty yeah. high. Yeah. Three games against three ranked teams all the way from home, Losing by an average of seven points, two of those games were definitely winnable at the end, both of them. And, and the A&M game, a break or two, a mistake or two here and there, and it could have been a totally different scenario in the, it, toward the end of the fourth quarter. So how's that spiraling out of control? That's what he would say that if he were here. He would say, what's wrong with you, Razorback? That's not spiraling out of control. <laughs> that is, you're having a disappointing year because some of these winnable games you didn't win. But that doesn't mean your program is going to pot, you know. It's not spiraling out of control. Uh, but, but, if, but if you're a Razorback fan, why do you say spiraling out of control? Because it seems like your quarterback is going backwards, and I would agree with that. K.J. is starting to throw picks, and he's throwing picks. Why? Because they're, they're consistently putting him in a position and I would like to know, one thing I would like to know, and again, is Sam Pittman that won't let us talk to coordinators or no, assistant coaches. One of the things I would like to ask is what happened, was, wasn't it the, the week of the LSU game or was it A&M? There was one of those weeks where, where the, they basically said we're going to move him more. And that sort of seemed to work. Remember, we're going to move him yeah, around more. Yeah, I think more. I want, want to say that was the. I, I think it was A and M. A and M. I think it was A and M. But the, now he's not back moving in this against Ole Miss. He's he's not moving anymore, right? Didn't yeah. he Basically, is more of a pocket yeah, passer. Yeah, he was again. he was back to being a pocket passer. Yeah. So, you know, when you look at it that way, it looks like spiraling out of control. But actually, I had I didn't I don't have these numbers with me. But I went back and looked at at, at KJ's numbers. For those three games, LSU, A&M, and Ole Miss, and his passing numbers went down against A&M, but that's because they have a better defense. But overall, it does, it's not like he's getting worse statistically. But what's happening to him, I think, is because he's, and Pittman explained this too, because he puts so much on his own shoulders and he's trying to win, he's pressing and making mistakes. And that's the part when you see him kind of getting, I don't know that he's getting worse, but he's not getting better. Yeah. And that's where the spiraling out of control thing comes. Maybe spiraling out of control with the lack of, complete lack of running game against an Ole Miss team that you should have been able to run better on than you did A&M. Yeah. They ran better on A&M than they did Ole Miss, and that is a little weird. Well, that's what I was going to say. You talk about the passing numbers, and you're like, okay, there wasn't really too much difference, but then you look at the on-the-ground numbers. And it was, the, I would, it was abysmal. Again, I go back to what I said earlier. <laughs> if you told me... I mean, Arkansas's defense would hold Ole Miss to 27 points. There's only one team that's done better against them, and that was Alabama. Yeah. Uh, if, if you told me that, I said they win the game because I thought Arkansas would score in the 30s. Yeah. And that's the, still the mystery to me about the Ole Miss game. Is there, if, you're, if you're Lane Kiffin, you're, he sort of explained it as their quarterback was beat up a little bit and their offense was out of sync. But thank God our defense stepped up. And that's the way you have to look at it. it his defense stepped up and did something that most people didn't think they would do in that game. Absolutely. I mean, if you don't have the defense or Ty Washington, right, you don't win that game. Like you're, you don't have even have a chance to you, win that you game. You get blown out. You get yeah. blown out. Exactly. Um, Razor Alex 88 says, and Mike, I, ha I hate this. I hate. We've lost Razor Alex 88. 
uh, I believe my optimism just died tonight. I'm being realistic. It looks like bowl eligibility is out of our reach this season. I just hate seeing our guys struggle like this this season. It just hurts my heart for them. And Razor Alex 88, I feel like, has some positive things to say after <laughs> these games. He usually does. He usually does. I, we've lost, we've lost well, Razor let, Alex. Let's address bowl eligibility <laughs> because, to me, this all comes down to what happens after Alabama, okay? Yeah. What happens after the Alabama game? Because you've got four SEC games left and a non-conference game. So how could you win all four of those games? Well, for one thing, even though Missouri fans would probably disagree with me on this, I think the three teams they have just lost to, plus the team they're about to play, are all better than the other four SEC teams that are left, right? Mm. Don't you? Mm, I mean, I would is say Missouri the Ar- better than any of these. I would say Missouri's Missouri better just than lost Arkansas. To LSU. No, I don't mean okay, Arkansas. Okay, okay. I'm talking about the teams that Arkansas has played. Oh yeah! Oh my Missouri gosh! Is, yes. Missouri just lost to LSU at home. Missouri lost at home to LSU. Would Missouri beat A and M? I mean, I'd like to see. I mean, would I think Missouri, they could put up a fight. Absolutely. Missouri would not beat A and M. Missouri, mm. Missouri would not beat uh, Ole Miss. So I'm saying Missouri is beatable. I don't know that they will, but that game mm. is here. You're not playing okay. them at their place. Okay. Uh, Auburn. Auburn is a team that because they all they gave Georgia a good game, now everybody suddenly says they're really good. Well, I watched them against A and M, and they were pitiful. So I don't know how good Auburn is, but Auburn certainly is not as good as the three teams they've just lost to. Okay, Florida. Florida's kind of weird. They've had good games. They've had bad games. But I wouldn't rate Florida ahead of any of these three teams Arkansas just lost to. No. Okay, and then you got Mississippi State. So if you happen to win all of those games and win your non-conference Florida International game, you have five wins to go with the two you already have. That's a seven and five season, and suddenly everything looks a lot better off-season-wise. Some of the fans, extreme fans, that want to win nine or ten games this year are still going to be mad. They're going to be mad because it means Pittman definitely keeps his job. But seven and five, and what if you go to a bowl game and you win eight games? That's a definite improvement over last year. Yeah, but you have to win So it's still still possible. So now what are we talking about when we said bowl eligibility? What that means is to be bowl eligible, I'm assuming they're going to beat Mississippi State, and maybe it's a mistake to assume that, but that Mississippi State is a cut below the other three teams. They, they are, yes. And you're playing them at home. Okay. So I'm saying of those other teams, those three teams, Florida, uh, Missouri, and what's the other one? And Auburn. And Auburn. you got to win two of those games. If you win two of those games, you're bowl eligible. That's all you got to do to be bowl eligible. Once you once, once this, you beat Mississippi State and then FIU. You beat Mississippi State, FIU, then win two of those three games. You either beat Florida and, <sighs> and uh, Missouri or Florida and uh, Auburn, and boom. You're, I think, you're I bowl think that's eligible. a really tall task, especially because <clears throat> Florida, you go to the Swamp. The Swamp is a crazy place to play. A lot of things happen there. Is, so, okay, let me ask you this. And they haven't won at the Swamp Would in a you long rather time. go to uh, Baton Rouge than no, the Swamp no, this year? No. No. Would no. you rather go to Ole Miss right now? No. No, but well, I'm just saying. I'm just I, telling you, I'm not saying they'll beat these teams, but okay. they have lost to teams that are better than these teams that you still have to play. They have. They have. I agree with you there. Missouri, I'm a little... And what if you go to the Swamp and lose, as long as you lose those other two games, that win those two well, games Well, then you home. would need to win what? Auburn and Missouri. At home. <sighs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Listen, I don't know. <laughs> Auburn and, beating Auburn and Missouri at home is, not, is, near, is near a challenge as trying to beat LSU or Ole Miss you know, or A and M on the on the road. A and M's not a real road game, but it's certainly not at home. And that, they had the home field advantage. They had more fans there than Arkansas did. Yeah. I so mean, I'm yeah. just saying, you could make an argument for if this team rebounds a little bit offensively. Once that starts, things could look a lot different than you're sitting there looking at right now. The average Razorback fan say, "No, we might not. We're only going to beat Florida International." I don't believe that. I believe I mean, they can I win. don't believe I don't believe they're going to go and lose all of these games. Mississippi State, Auburn, Florida, Missouri. They will get then some you don't wins believe here. they should be able to win two of those three, the two at home, for instance. I just I look at these. I think Missouri is a tough tough opponent this year. I, which way ever you slice and dice it, I think Missouri is so, better than people think. So they are. you can't beat Missouri at home. 
but you, but Missouri just lost to LSU at home, and you're saying Missouri is equal to LSU. No, I'm saying Missouri's a better team than what people think they are. So I think Missouri's, not- Missouri's going to be a tough one. I think Florida's going to be tough in the swamp. I think they are, yes, I think Florida's, Arkansas. Florida's not tougher in the swamp than LSU is at, at Baton Rouge. That's I mean, not even. Well, but no, but it's, it's, I went to Baton Rouge. As a Florida grad, I have been to the swamp many times. I went to Baton Rouge. Baton Rouge's environment is insane. Yeah. That environment is crazy. By far, one of the most insane environments I've ever been to. But the swamp, when it's packed with 90,000, is also Pretty crazy. Are the swamp so, going to be fired up for Arkansas? That's what I'm saying. It, will not. the swamp be fired up for no, Arkansas? No, they won't be. So <laughs> we'll again, see. we'll see. I, I, I'll be cautiously I'm just, optimistic. I'm just optimistic about what happens after Alabama. Okay, I, I agree with you there. I kind of like that. It's just you also have Mississippi State, right? They're not a great team this year. We've they seen can that. beat you. But they can beat you, but it's also an 11 a.m. game. It's kind of like I we know Arkansas. We don't know. There might be 50,000 people there if they lose to Alabama. So, yeah. That's what I'm saying. It may not be a competitive environment, and you, you want it to be a competitive environment. I just, I'm going to stay cautiously optimistic. I'll say that. I feel like I say that a lot in the show. I just, I don't see a lot of wins there. But, Mike, I like your optimism. Marty Bird's proxy wants to know, is there an overall lack of big play ability on the offense, or is the scheme holding some of the would-be playmakers back? Big chunk plays are hard to come by. Well, I mean, we've already discussed yeah, this. Yeah, we have. You don't have. They've had one or two chunk. I know they had the one, who was that against BYU, the one long running play by A.J. Green. Yeah, that was BYU. But yeah. you don't have chunk running plays when you can't even get four yards most of the time. So that cuts the chunk plays down there. Again, it's all related to lack of blocking. Yeah. And they've had some big, long pass plays. I mean, come on. They had a couple of the highs. Uh, the, the Andrew Armstrong's had a big chunk play pass. Mm-hmm. So they've had some long touchdown passes, but you don't have a lot of them because you're, you, you generally don't. And again, to me, if you roll KJ out and get him on the edge where he's out of that, I think this is the one thing I still criticize Enos about. You sticking him in this little box mm-hmm. and, and all these guys are in front of him and he's supposed to throw over that into all this. When you, if you roll, you roll him, him out, out to the corner, he now, and look, we've talked before, he's not a guy that's going to go through progressions. He's not a, oh, there's one guy, there's another guy, there's another guy. He is at his best when he has maybe two guys that he likes to throw to. So he rolls out, he's looking for them. One, he's, it's a two-progression thing. Oh, he's not open. Okay, this guy is. Boom. And then, and then, and then he scores. To me, they got to do that more. Yeah. I agree with you. I'd like to see that for sure. I'd like to see it more because I think you're, at this point, try something. Get something going. Well, they did it, and then now they're not doing it again. Yeah, well, they did it. Yes, you're right. Well, maybe. That's good. Again, I'm saying that I've already said that I don't think that Eno's offense is why this is looking bad, but that one, the one argument you could make against it is that part of it where they're expecting him to stay in, in and pocket. be a pocket passer. Yeah. That's not what he is. Pig, oh, yeah, no, you're right about that. Pig Daddy Kane asks, as a SWC guy, what are your thoughts on the Utah NIL deal where every player gets a $65,000 Ram truck? When I saw the story, I thought of Eric Dickerson's good old gold Trans Am. Well, I don't like this way of dealing with NIL because I don't think it benefits the players in the long term. I mean, you're giving somebody something temporary. It's a lease. So big whoop, I got a nice pickup for a year. Then what happens? I don't know. Do they give me a a real good deal on buying it back? I don't know. I would prefer money. (laughs) You'd prefer $65,000 cash. Well, come up with a a collective and, and make some money, you know, for these guys and distribute the money equally. Here's what I, I'm not against NIL, but this is the way I think NIL should work. I've talked about it before. Mm -hmm. Make these students part-time employees and and come up with a reasonable figure that you can afford, and it should be national. Um, They could all put money into a fund. Every school, they could take it out of TV revenues or whatever, and every athlete gets a same amount. Hmm. uh, And this is all of them, Uh, not just, you know, football players, but they all get a certain amount. Now, it won't be 65,000. It might be 20. But they're already getting almost 1,000 a month, which is you know, 1,200, 12,000. So if you get every athlete's got $30,000, listen, 
When I was in college, I worked part-time jobs for a dollar an hour, and, and you know, you, you're you just trying to come up with enough money to pay your rent. I didn't have my rent paid. I didn't have my food paid for. I lived with one guy a, a whole semester because he had a, uh, an off-campus housing thing with the cafeteria, and he would bring food to me. I couldn't afford food. So you're saying this is not good, that you've got room and board paid for, you've got your tuition, you've got about $1,000 a month, and let's add two more thousand for everybody, volleyball players, yeah. all the way up to football players. Everybody gets that amount. And then what you do is you allow these players to have NIL agents who can go out and get them a separate deal if their agent can do that. And I don't think the average guy that doesn't can't do that would get mad because you're still getting some NIL money. No. And you're not going to be mad at the quarterback because he's got an agent that, if he's a good quarterback, that got him a 75, 100, 150,000, even a half million. I think most people understand the economics of that. But I don't like the way it is done now. I just, mm -hmm. I, I think everybody should benefit from NIL and it's not happening. Well, I don't, I don't hate this deal. I, I, I don't. And, I, and the reason why is because I remember you talk about being a broke college kid, right? Okay, so There's, wow, you get a little vehicle for well, one some, year. Some of these people don't have transportation. Okay, I think, so I think you it's got a it for great, a year and then what do you do? Yeah, well, you, they might re-up the lease if you stay there next year or whatever. We don't know the full deal. It may, may say that, hey, if you stay for four years or you stay another year, you can keep the truck for another year or whatever it is and they'll lease it out to you the next year you play. But I, I think for me, having a car, having someone say, here's a car, Courtney, that you can drive around on campus, that you can get to different places, that you can take your girlfriend out or boyfriend out, whoever it is, on a Friday night, Saturday night, you know, drive them on a date. I, I think, think you take a chunk of the TV revenues that are available across the country to, to Power 5 schools. Right. And you throw that into a pot and you divide it equally among all everywhere. I don't agree. I don't disagree with that idea. I'm just saying I don't hate this and then idea. You still either. allow for some capitalism. If you're a high dollar, sure. you know, high profile player, you can go get your own agent and get get a separate sure. deal. I don't hate that. I'm just also I don't hate this this for right now because this is how it is. The Utah players, I think that's pretty awesome, and they're and they're probably pretty happy that they have transportation and a a brand new Ram truck to drive yeah, around in. Them. I mean, that's I I think it's kind of awesome. We have gone way too long on this, as my. We'll uh, answer your questions next Monday.